Now, how do you know it's a pizza? Can you smell it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You smell that? You don't smell that? We're going to have to pray for your nose, right? You smell that? Can you feel that on the bottom? Yeah. Feel that on the bottom. What do you, you feel that? Yeah. So what do we have here? Now, just so you don't have to believe the, the people in the front and thinking they're trying to do something. What do you smell, big boy? You smell it? Smell like a hamburger? Huh? A pizza smells like a pizza. So what do we have? Pizza, so you can fill the box and you can smell it. But how do you know it's a pizza? It's not a trick question. How do you know it's a pizza? It's a pizza box. So you're telling me you can look at the pizza box and you can smell it and you can feel the heat coming from it and you know that there's a pizza. Isn't that interesting? So you're telling me that based on looking at the container, you know there's a pizza. So you know there's something on the inside. And you're telling me that what's on the inside is actually affecting what's on the outside. Some of the smart people are, are getting it now. What's on the inside is working on the outside. Oh, I'm, I'm getting hungry. But I want you to notice something. Is this a pizza? Now, you said it was. But is this a pizza? No. no. It's just a carton. It's a box. It's the container. It's a container for what's inside. Now, there, there is a pizza on the inside. Now, <laughs> now I want you to notice. There's a pizza, right? There's also a box, Right? Now, this box, is that the pizza? No, but when you first saw it, you said it's a pizza. Right? And yet, what's on the inside is affecting the outside. It's affecting the carton. It's affecting the container. There's, there's a, I mean, the box smells like pizza. It's in there. And you can feel the heat coming through from the pizza into the box. Here's the point. You are a spirit. And you have a body. You are not a body. But what's on the inside. Was meant to affect what's on the outside. God made you to be a what? He didn't make you to be a box. He made you to be a pizza. Huh? But he puts you in a box. Right? Well, you and I, we are not a body. But we are, when we are born into this world, and, and as we grow up, we, we learn everything there is about this body. And over time, we become very, very conscious of this body, and we identify with this body, and we forget who we really, really are. We forget that we are a spirit being that lives in this body. And yet, because we forget that we're a spirit being and we identify with this body, when things begin to happen with this body, we look at it as very, very, very big. And it's because we forgot what's on the inside. God never made you to identify as a box. He made you to identify as a pizza. So if you don't get anything spiritual from this tonight, go out saying, I'm a pizza, not a box. Great revelation there. So let's put some scripture to this. And then there's some, I guarantee you there's some things that's going to come from this. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn over to Genesis chapter 1. All of you Bible scholars, what's happening over in Genesis? Creation. God's creating the sun, the moon, the stars, the animals. And, and then we get to the very last thing he's making here, and it's man. And in verse 26... It says, God said, let's make man in our image according to our likeness. Who, who's talking here? This is God, right? And this is God's idea. This was not Hagen, Copeland, whoever you want to come up with. This was God that says this here. He said, let us make man in whose image? Our image. So God said, let's make man to be like us. Make him in our image and in our likeness. 
And he said, let them have dominion over, over all the things that creep on the earth. So man created man, or God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then you get down to, to chapter 2 and verse 7. And it says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. So what did God form from the ground? He formed the box. Right? He formed the box. Now, Adam wasn't there. It was just a box. But then once God made the box, he... And he put himself, he put his life, he put his pizza in the box. And so it wasn't just some little Caesar's pizza or Domino's pizza or Papa John's pizza. It was a pizza filled with God himself. It was a pizza filled with divinity. It was a pizza filled with eternity. The spirit that got God put Adam into the body. And when God put Adam into the body, I want you to notice what happened with that very dormant body. All of a sudden, the body began to move. The body became alive. The body became animated. Why? Because life got in the body. You see, right here from the very beginning of creation, God's intent, his plan for mankind was that the spirit was to affect the body. That the body was to be affected by what was on the inside. And yet over time, you and I, we have so identified with this and we have looked at this to tell me what I have from God. And yet that's why we've got it so jacked up because we have magnified this and minimized what's on the inside to the point where we're wondering, do I even have what God said I have? So God puts Adam in the body. And it's just like, uh, you know, those of you that watch Frosty the Snowman. Now, I love being able to tell this story here in America. You can't tell it in a lot of other countries. I realized that the first time I told this in Nairobi, Kenya, I'm talking about Frosty the Snowman, and they looked at me like I was stupid. They're like, who's Frosty? And I was telling it, <laughs> I, was, I was in Gdansk, Poland, I was telling the story, and they're just looking at me like, who's Frosty? And I forgot that they didn't have TV until 1989 because of communism and stuff. But all of us, we've seen Frosty the Snowman. And remember when Frosty the Snowman was made by the kids? He was made of snow, and they put a little corn cob pipe and a button nose and two eyes made of, you know, coal, right? See, you've seen it. And Frosty was a, was a great little snowman, but there was no life until the magic hat got put on top. And as soon as something supernatural got on the natural, all of a sudden the natural responded, and all of a sudden, happy birthday! Why? Because even with Frosty, even something make-believe, even those writers understood that it took something spiritual, something supernatural to make something natural move. When the natural and the supernatural come together, it's the natural that's supposed to budge. It's the natural that's supposed to be affected by the supernatural, by the spiritual. And you see this right here in the very beginning. This was God's plan. You, you've got to understand that our body, literally, we have, we have magnified the body. We've, we've made it to be such a big deal so that to the point when we get a pain, we get an ache. I mean, it's just a massive deal. And, and even if there's a cancer diagnosis, we're like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? I could die. So what? <laughs> and I don't mean that to be insensitive, but, but just take it a step back. Remember. We're a spirit. So what if I leave my body? I'm still alive. I just changed addresses. But that's why we have such a fear of death because we don't really know who we are because we identify with this. And if I was to die, I mean, you know, if I didn't do this and I didn't do that, I could die. Well, so what? Because saints, you got to understand that even in death, we still have the victory. We still have the victory. There's no losing. And a lot of us have gotten in, in condemnation about that. Well, you know, this person was standing on this or believing this and, you know, it didn't happen. And I don't understand why. Well, okay, I get it. I mean, we grieve for that person. But you got to remember, if they had a choice to come back or not, they wouldn't. <laughs> right? 
But you see it in Genesis what Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 1. God made the spirit. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't make the body to be like him, so to speak. He made the spirit and then put the spirit in the body. And he made the body so perfectly matched with your spirit that it matched up so well. It was a perfect match. And that everything you are would be expressed through this. That's all that this is. It's just a tool for us to be able to function as a spirit in the earth. But you have to also understand that not only we are a spirit, but God put his life on the inside of that spirit. God was in that spirit. His life was in that spirit. Everything that God is was in that man. Well, we know the story that one day Adam decided not to be a man one day. Right? The Bible says that Eve was deceived, but Adam's the one that sinned. And the interesting thing about that story there in Genesis chapter 3 is that the serpent shows up and she tells, the serpent tells Eve and says, hey, if you eat of that fruit, you'll be like God. And the reason Eve was deceived was because she didn't understand she already was. Right? It was the ultimate deception. And you know what? It's still working today. Eve didn't understand what she was, who she was. She said, if I could eat that, I'd be like God. But the problem was she already was. And so what, what set in motion, and we can learn from history. We've got to start learning from history. What happened was she started working. She started looking to self to try to get something God had already gave her and made her. And that's where she lost out. And yet, Del Adams just standing there watching the whole thing happen. And he knows exactly what's going on and who he is. But he just sat there and watched. He must have been something good looking. For, for Adam just to stand there and watch. So, but when, when they sinned there, when Adam sinned, what did God say? He said, on that, if you do this, on that day you will do what? You'll die. Now, they didn't physically die that day. They spiritually died. They were separated from God. And when they were separated from God, they lost that connection with God. He lost that life of God that was on the inside of him. So now he's spiritually dead. And yet there was so much of this life in his body, it took Adam over 900 years to learn how to die. Right? And then what you see is over time, death starts taking more and more and more and more drowned and more and more and more and more victory well thank god god had a plan and his plan was jesus right and so jesus is referred to in the bible as the second adam or the last adam so jesus came to restore back to us what adam lost and then some extra right i mean the bible tells us that this new covenant we have is even better than the old covenant it's established upon better promises so for us to have a better covenant with, with better promises, that means at the very least we have to have the best of the best in the old. And a part of that was God's life being on the inside of men. And so you see it all through the prophets. I mean, they're prophesying about what was coming. And all through the Old Testament, the relationship of God and man was God with man. But what we saw coming was not just going to be God with man and not just God for man. It was going to be God in man. Pete's in the box. Pete's in the box. And so if you look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In him, right there in verse 4, it says, In him, talking about Jesus, in him was what? Go ahead and turn there. You can turn there if you need to. In him was life. In him was life, and Jesus was life. John chapter 1, here, let's go and turn there. I don't want to act like, um, you know it, and, and some people maybe have never read it, don't know it. So rest your eyes on it, underline it, highlight it. John chapter 1, verse 4, in him was what? Life. Life. And that life was the light of men. That word life, there is the Greek word zoe, Z-O-E. The life of God, the life that God is, and the life that God has. It says, in Jesus, in Christ, was this life. So Jesus is coming in the form of a man to fix what Adam jacked up. But notice that what God put in the first Adam and the first Adam lost, God put it in the last Adam to restore it. 
Because what God was doing was this. Everything he wanted in you, he was putting in Jesus. Because what was going to happen through salvation was you were going to get in Christ. And so God starts this plan and he puts his life on the inside of Jesus. And then in John chapter 5 and verse 21 and 26, go ahead and turn over there. John chapter 5 and verse 21. Let me check my time. John chapter 5 and verse 21. Now we see Jesus here. And and I always want to point this out. And I want you to remember, Jesus is doing life as a man. He's doing life just like you. He's got a brain like you, a body like you, emotions like you, a soul like you. He's doing life as a man. Philippians 2 says that Jesus, he humbled himself. And he laid aside everything that gave him an advantage in life. And he came and did life as a man. If Jesus did life as God and I see all the miracles that he did, if he did life as God, then I can sit there in amazement and worship him and say, thank you, Jesus, you are awesome. But if I see Jesus do life as me, it compels me to do what he did. Let me say that again. If I see Jesus do life like me, it compels me to do the very same thing. It shows me what is possible. Jesus, he is the standard. Thank God for Kenneth Hagin. Thank God for John Lake. Thank God for Smith Wigglesworth, Jack Coe, uh, Catherine Kuhlman. You can name all of them, but they are not my standard. Thank God for the example that they gave. But they are not my standard. Jesus is my standard. Jesus is the one that showed me exactly what was possible, exactly what could be done. Jesus is the way. He's the way. Not a man, not a woman that came before. Thank God for the example. Thank God for the legacy. But even Brother Hagin, I sat in in his very last class, and from the pulpit he looked at all of us and he said, you can start where I'm finishing. I will never forget that as long as it, 26 years old, and the prophet of God looks down, and I mean, over 70 years of ministry, and he said, you can start where I'm finishing. And I remember looking around at all those students. I didn't know what they were thinking, but I said, by God, I'm grabbing hold of that. I'm not saying that I've arrived, but I'm telling you what, we will. And then we'll go past it. Why? Because revelation is progressive. There's always more. And yet Jesus showed us where we could go. You may wonder why he's shouting back there. I mean, he told me why why he's all excited. I'd be excited too. (laughs) If I can't, I I dealt with that. So right here in John chapter 5, we see here that Jesus now understands what he has. In verse 21, he says this. He says, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son, notice this, even so, in the very same way, to the very same degree, even so the son gives life to, Notice this phrase, to whomever he will. Why? Because when you are a possessor of something, you can give it away without even asking permission. This is why you never, and I mean, you you do not find it in the Gospels, you do not find Jesus standing before someone and asking God permission, is it your will to heal this person? And you never see Jesus stand before a person and say, God, give me enough power Give me enough anointing. Give me, give me a fresh this. Give me this or that so that I can do this. No, Jesus understood that what he had was more than enough to accomplish the will of God in that situation. And yet this is why, man, I'm try, not, trying not to get ahead of myself, but this is why many of us, we do not understand who we are. We do not understand what we have. And therefore, we're going to conference to conference to conference and church to church to church, trying to get enough anointing and enough gifting and enough this and enough that to accomplish what Jesus said we could do. And yet, when Jesus got on the inside of us, that should have been enough. Because you don't see the early church praying like the modern church. God, give me more. God, give me more. God, give me more. More love, more power, more of this in my life. Well, if you need more, you need to get saved. Because when I got in him, all that he is got in me. And so you see here, Jesus in John chapter 5, he understands this. Remember, he's having to renew his mind just like you and I are too. He's doing life as a man. 
And he's at the point now, he understands, I've got something. I've got this very same life, this Zoe life on the inside of me. And I can give it away just like God gives it away. And in verse 26, he makes a powerful statement here. He's still talking. He said, for as the Father has life in himself, so the Son has life where? In himself. For as the Father has life in him, to the very same degree, the very same quantity, so, as, so does the Son have life in himself. As the Father has it, the Son has it. Let me ask you something. Is God your Father? See, it's high time we start identifying with Jesus. We need to start identifying as Jesus. And the more you start identifying with Jesus, then, then the less you'll start being looking around and thinking you don't have enough. And the reason we look around and think we don't have enough is because we look too much and we identify with the box instead of the pizza. We look around and we look at this body and think, I'm not enough. I've screwed up too many times. I've messed up. I've jacked up. You know, I haven't prayed enough. I haven't confessed enough. I haven't worked enough. I haven't given enough. I haven't taken enough Bible school lessons. I don't have enough, you know, initials after my last name. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I need to get more. I need to get more. I need to get more. And yet, if we would simply just open up the box and look at what's in the box, you'd find out you have more than enough. See, guys, this isn't some great revelation. We know, most of us in here, we know these scriptures. Greater is he who's in me. Greater is the pizza on the inside of me than the box on the outside. Right? Greater is he who's in me than he who is in the, the world. So Jesus says that in John 5. He says this very same life the Father has is the very same life I have. And as the Father can raise the dead and give that life away, so can the Son. So what you do is you see this progression of revelation here. Right here you see Jesus understands he's a possessor of something. And then there's a very, very well-known passage of Scripture that pretty much everybody in here can probably quote, and it's John chapter 10 and verse 10, where Jesus says, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you would go to heaven. That you would go to heaven. No, Jesus said, I came to give you something, not take you somewhere. He said, I came to give you something. Now, I'm not saying that they're heaven. Very much a heaven. Very much a heaven. A heaven again and a hell to shun. But Jesus did not go through everything he did just to take you somewhere. Jesus came and did everything he did to put something on the inside of you. He came to put something on the inside of you. Otherwise, if the, if the whole purpose was just to go to heaven, the moment you say, Jesus, be my Lord, psst, we're out of here. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was that you would have the very same substance on the inside of you that made him him so that you could represent him with perfection on the earth. What you see is, I call it the road of life. How many of you grew up Baptist? You learned the Roman road? You know the Roman road? Well, this is what I called the road of life. You see it. God puts it into Jesus. Jesus understands what's he, what he has. Then in John 10, 10, he reveals that he knows his purpose. To take what's on the inside and to give it away. And then in John chapter 17, we find Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. And I, I absolutely love, love, love John 17. We're actually doing, we're working on a book right now for, on it. John chapter 17. And we find Jesus praying. And I love, actually go and turn there real quick. John chapter 17 in verse uh, 20 and 23 so many times we look at it and we see Jesus just praying there in sweat and blood. But in John 17, we find out so many wonderful things about our identity in him and what Jesus really came to do for us. John chapter 17 and verse 20, Jesus says, I don't pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Father, I pray that they would all be what? That they would be one. This is Jesus' prayer. How many of you know Jesus gets his prayers answered? Jesus said, Father, I pray they would all be one, just as you, Father, are where? In me. In me. And that I am where? In me. That the world would be where? In one us. in us. That they would be one in us, so the world would believe that you sent me. Now, this one boggled me for a while. 
Think about what Jesus said. He said, Father, I pray that in the very same way you're in me and I am you, that they would be one in us so the world would know you sent me. Now think about that. How would the world know by looking at us that God sent Jesus? Think about that statement. How is it that God planned for the world to look at us and know God sent a Savior to this world by looking at you? Well, if you're, if you're basing your identity on the box, I mean, the box could be, it could be a little bruised on the outside and crumpled up and stuff, and you could be looking at it and say, uh, I got a long way to go. But if you look at who you are on the inside, you realize you're just like him. And what you, what you start to find out is the more you begin to realize and become conscious of what's here, then it begins to affect what's here. And this was the whole purpose of this, or one major purpose of this life, was so that what was on the inside of your spirit would actually affect your body. And we see it happen with Jesus. Remember the story about when Jesus, he was on the mountain, he was praying, right? He's praying, and all of a sudden as he's praying, his body begins to shine, glistening white, bleached, white as snow, the glory of God on the inside of him. That life. And remember what we read in John chapter 1 verse 4. In him is life. And that life is the light. This light, this life is shining out of the spirit of Jesus. To such a degree it's getting into his skin. To such a degree it's getting in his clothes. Friend, I'm telling you. What's on the inside was made to affect what's on the outside. To such a degree that just as you're sitting here right now, that life is beginning to, to churn on the inside of you. And as we're just talking about it, it's beginning to flow into some of your bodies. And some of the pains and the aches and things that you came in here with are already gone. And some of, some of the issues that you came in here with are already beginning to mend and disappear. Amen. Amen. Friends, let me tell you something. And th this is what I'm trying to work on, okay? Thank God for the laying on of hands. It's legitimate. It's scripture. Okay? But we have gotten so focused on somebody laying hands on me, we forgot about the one who got in me. Because I'm telling you, I get the emails and the messages all the time. I'm so behind on emails because there's too many. And it's the same thing. Chad, pray for me. Can we do a Zoom meeting? Can we do this? Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. I see all the miracles that are happening. And yet, what we're doing is trying to encourage people, but remember who's on the inside of you. Because, friends, you're going to be in situations. You're not going to have your pastor. You're not going to have your, your, your bishop, your apostle, your, your whatever you got. There, there's going to be times you ain't going to have them. You need to be able to be, do it just you and Jesus. Thank God for faith buddies. But you know what? You're not always going to have a faith buddy around. And yet we've got to remember that in reality, the whole issue of laying on of hands in the New Testament was actually for us in the center. Serious. And yet we do read over there, and I'm not stupid. We do read over there in James. You know, he said, if any, any sick among you in the church. Of course, the question today, is anybody healed in the church? I mean. But he said, you know, is anybody sick? If there is, if there is, call for the elders of the church. And, you know, go. But, you know, Rick Renner, fabulous teacher, extremely smart man. You listen to him and you feel stupid. Greek scholar, and he brought it out. He talked about, he said, you know, when the Bible's talking about sick there, he's actually talking about somebody that's either an invalid, they're bedridden, or they're in such dire pain they can't believe for themselves. So they need somebody to come and give them a little jolt, a little help with their faith. He's not talking about the person who's just dealing with some issues, and, and, and they just, they want somebody to come lay hands on. Thank God that we can do that. But friends, so much of the church is so busy on the church, we can't get focused on the world. Amen. And the reason is because we don't, we don't know who we are. We, we, just, we identify with the box. We don't know what's on the inside. Let me give you one scripture. I'm going to give you an example. And then we're going to start ministering to some of you. Actually, I say this. Who, who, um, who, who's somebody in here? It may be somebody that's watching online, but I think it's somebody that's in here. Who, who's got some, some spine issues going on? 
maybe even, a, I'd say two things, actually, a curvature of the spine, and I dare say that even maybe somebody that's got some, some growth or lumps on the spine, uh, even toward, down toward the, the bottom a little bit. So what's going on with you? Uh-huh. Are you mom? Your mom? So, so feel right now and, and where it's curved. Do you know where it's curved? You do? Right there? Okay. And who was the other? Did you raise your hand, ma'am? What's going on with you? What's going on with you? It's discs. Okay. What's going on with you? Scoliosis. Scoliosis. And, uh, yes, sir? The sacral. That nerve right there? All right. Somebody back here? Yes, two. All right, next to you. Just something's wrong with me. Okay. Yes, ma'am. A spur. Okay. All right. So even issues like this. Okay. Scoliosis can't really fix that. I mean, they can do some things to help. Stuff like that can't really can't really do anything medicinally or anything like that. They can do some things to help. But what just, if maybe possible, what's on the inside just started working in your body right now? Look, let me show you some, let me show you some scripture here. So look, I just want to put that in your, in your thought right there, okay? I just want you to think about that. That maybe, just maybe, something's working in my body right now. Amen. Is it possible that there's so much of the life of God on the inside of your spirit that God knew what you would need. God put so much in there that it would actually affect your body and still be plenty of left over to give to somebody else. Let me ask you this question. Okay, we have no problem thinking and believing, most of us anyway, that when I go and lay hands on the sick for somebody, that the power of God's going to go out of me and into them. Most of us don't have an issue with that at all. We don't think twice about it. Let me ask you this question. Why would the power of God be on the inside of me for somebody else but not be on the inside of me for me? I mean, guys, this is just common sense, and this is where I get frustrated with Christianity right now. It's only inside of me for me to give away to somebody else, but I don't have it for me, so i got to get somebody else to come and lay hands on me. But how can it be on the inside of me for somebody else? It's got to be there. Anybody ever used a garden hose, a water hose? What's the purpose of a water hose? To get things wet. Have you ever gotten a water hose and just thrown it on the ground and it's not connected to anything? What does it do? Nothing. But as soon as you connect it to the spigot and you cut it on, then all of a sudden now it can begin to serve its purpose because now it's connected and it's abiding, it's dwelling at the source. And now what's coming from the source is flowing through it and now it's getting the grass wet and the flowers wet and the tree wet or your car wet or, you know, your dog wet. Right? Or your kid and they come by and spray them real cold. Gets those things wet. But friend, think about it. While it's serving its purpose, the garden hose is also getting wet too. It can't go on the outside without being on the inside. What if right now where you're sitting, some ears are beginning to open up that couldn't hear? What if some of you that came in here and couldn't walk all of a sudden realized, I can't. Let me show you this. Second Corinthians chapter five. Second Corinthians chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter four and verse seven. In verse six, Paul makes a statement. He says, "God who commanded light to shine out of darkness." Verse seven, he said, "We have this treasure in earthen vessels." So he's not talking about the body that you get when you go to heaven. 
He said, earthen vessels, these right here. You know, that body that when you get up in the morning, you look in the mirror in the bathroom, you go, ooh, that's sexy, that body right there. <laughs> he said, we have this treasure in this sexy body, right? This body right here. He said, we have this treasure, this light, this power in this earthen vessel. And notice what he goes on to say. He said that the excellence of the what? Of the power. Not so I can just be a good little Christian and follow all the good little Christian rules. No, he said the power, that the excellence of the power would be of God and not of us. Verse 8, but we are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Notice this, underline it, highlight it, post it, note it. Always caring about in the body. What? Caring where? In the body. The dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus, the life of who? Same Greek word. So that the life of Jesus would be made manifest in our body. What body is he talking about? This body, your sexy body. <laughs> that the life of Jesus, because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that the very same life that flowed on the inside of him would be made manifest in this body. And yet for all the religious people who would say, oh, he's talking about your spiritual body when you die and go to heaven. Then Paul answers it for the dumb people. <laughs> in verse 10, he says, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus would be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Our mortal flesh. Our mortal flesh. And yet it's very interesting that before Paul's talking about this, in chapter 3, he's talking about the glory of the old covenant. And he's talking about the glory of God that Moses was experiencing. And then when Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights with God, and when Moses came down from that mountain and Moses' face was shining with the glory of God. And Paul's talking about it. And he said, that was an old glory. That was a former thing. And he said, the new thing is much greater than the former. He said, the former was passing away, but the new one's going to stay. But guys, think about it. When Moses went up there, that glory, that power, the life of God, the light of God, it got into his skin. So much so, his face is shining. And he had to, he had to put a cloth on it because people were freaking out. But the Bible tells us that that glory, that, that light that got in his skin, it was diminishing. But think about with Jesus. So Moses, think about it. Moses, he is a sinner. He isn't saved. He's not born again, spirit filled. Baptized, tongue, tongue talking, Bible thumping, seated at the right hand of God. He's none of that. He's a sinner. He's a former murderer. And yet... The life of God, that light, it got into his skin. And then we see with Jesus that when Jesus was on that mountain, he was praying and hanging out with God. That life got into his skin. But what was the difference? For Moses, that light, that life came from the outside in. With Jesus, it came from the inside out. It came from the inside out. It came from the inside out. See, with Moses, it was coming from the outside in. And see, it's a wonderful example for the sinner. See, the life of God, it is not prejudiced. It's not racist. It doesn't even care what religion you are. And we get all worked up about that. But again, remember, the Great Commission is for the sinner. It doesn't matter if they're Buddhist, they're Muslim, whatever. Jesus said, lay hands on the sick. And he's talking about the sinner. So obviously you don't get, have to get good enough to get healed. If you don't have to get good enough as a sinner to get healed, we've all messed up. But you got, you got to remember, you actually did get good enough. Because if you think you're not good enough, you're looking at the box. When you begin to understand who you are and who you became one with, you understand that you are the very righteousness of God in Christ, that in the very same way, to the very same degree that God is right, so are you. So you're always good enough to be healed. You're always good enough to be healed. Doesn't matter what you've done. 
The blood of Jesus is greater. The grace of God is greater than your mess up. Because even in your mess up, you're just like the Messiah. Because you're not the box. You weren't united to the box. You were united to the pizza. Now let me finish with, with this one little passage of Scripture. And some of this, this may rock your boat, and I don't mean to, but then I kind of do. <laughs> so how many of you have ever heard about the woman with the issue of blood? Oh, yeah. I mean, classic healing Scripture, right? Well, let's think about this story. So you have the woman with the issue of blood. I mean, I've heard it preached. You've probably heard it preached all kind of ways and all kind of wonderful ways and so many wonderful faith principles there and truths there. But let's think about this story. So you have this woman, she heard about Jesus and she starts pressing through the crowd and, and you know, because of who she was and what she was going on with her, she was unclean. She could have been stoned, killed for being out doing what she was doing. But she said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch the hem of his garment and she's pressing through the crowd and she's confessing, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed, I know I'll be well. And we know the story that she goes through and she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? I felt power flow out of me. And then she turns around and says, it was me, it's me, it's me. And then she's down in shame or whatever. And he deals with it. And it's been interesting to me that that has been a, I mean, it's a classic healing scripture. It's a classic healing scripture. But I question if we've been preaching it right. And the reason is this. The woman with the issue of blood was not saved. She was not born again, spirit-filled. She was not united with God. She was outside of Christ. So she had to press through the crowd. She had to get to him. But you've got to understand that as a Christian, the healer got on the inside of you. So now I'm no longer the woman with the issue of blood trying to get to Jesus because Jesus got in me. I'm not even trying to touch the hem of his garment. You might want to touch your own. Because you've got a garment of salvation and a robe of righteousness. And you say, that's blasphemous, brother. No, God set this thing up. God gave you his righteousness in Christ. It had nothing to do with you and your confession and your doing this and your good deeds and all that. It had everything to do with Jesus' perfection and everything that he accomplished for you through his death, burial, and resurrection. It's all about Jesus, but we've made it all about us. But we know our scriptures and we know our confessions. And we've got our faith formulas. And we're frustrated because it ain't working. And it's high time we begin to humble ourselves and realize, you know what? We've gotten in the way. We've gotten in the way. Isn't it interesting that, you know, we quote 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I'm a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. You know, we got the t-shirt. We got the poster. We got the bumper sticker. I mean, we've, we've got it everywhere. I'm a brand new creature in Christ. I'm one with Christ. I'm one with him. And we, we teach one with Christ and all of these other subjects. But when it comes to healing now, all of a sudden I'm separated from him. So in other words, we preach united with all these other subjects except for healing. And then when we get to healing, we separate. And now we're beginning to identify as the woman with the issue of blood. And I don't have it. I got to try to figure out how to get there so I can get it. But I'm sorry, I thought I got in him and one with him and one with him and he one with me. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, In him is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost wrapped up in a body. And if he stopped right there, we'd say, praise Jesus. Hallelujah. But he went on and in verse 10 he said, And you are complete in him. If you're complete, you're not missing anything. You are complete in him. in him as the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And he said, and you are complete in him. You are complete. In him. We've got to start thinking like this. This, not complete. What's on the inside, complete. What's on the inside is complete. Perfect. Righteous. 
Guys, think about it. God, it's all about union. It's all about unity here. God cannot unite himself with something that isn't as perfect as he is. Think about that. This is why no Christian should ever, 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 ever have any type of complex about themselves. Ever. Ever have any type of inferiority complex. Ever. Because he made you to be exactly like him in every way except you are totally dependent on him. Jesus said in John 15, he said, I am the vine and you are the branch. He said, if I abide in you and you abide in me, you will produce much fruit. How do we get this fruit to be produced? By abiding in him. So you've got to understand positionally, we're already there. But we have to expand our soul, our soul to understand in reality who we are and what we already have. And this is why we're confusing the heck out of a lot of people because we come to our churches and we preach by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. Woo-hoo! Now come up here so you can receive your healing. <laughs> Think about it. That's just common sense. My common sense is getting me in trouble because I'm very analytical, but that doesn't take too much analyzation. Think about it. If you come from the outside and you're not Christianized, you're not churchyized, and for 45 minutes you're told that you were healed at salvation, now come up here so you can get your healing. Well, either I have it or I don't. Either I have it or I don't. Well, but we'll say, well, yeah, I know what it says, but you don't understand. You, you, don't, you, you don't feel what I feel. And I'm, I'm not putting down the, the feelings and the hurts and the aches and the pains and the gross and the ears and the eyes. I'm not putting that down at all. But those things are of the body. They're not you. They do not define you. They do not tell you what you have from God. They do not tell you what you have from God. They do not tell you what you have from God. But we're looking at this and quoting our scriptures and making our, going down our confession sheets, doing all our things, and yet we're looking at this to tell me if I have it or not. But we need to look at is what's on the inside, who's on the inside, and the moment I begin to identify with the one who died for me, who redeemed me, who set me free, and then jumped on the inside so he could live through me, the moment I begin to identify with him, then I stop identifying with the body. See, guys, what you are most aware of, what you are most conscious of, that is what you are connected to. And what you're connected to is what's going to be the most real to you. And what's the most real to you, that's what you're going to put your faith on, whether you realize it or not. And what you put your faith on, that's what you will experience. And it has been a very, very subtle trick for 6,000 years that even in our spirit-filled, charismatic, word of faith, blab it, grab it, whatever you want to call it, That right here we know all these truths, but they're just information. And it hasn't truly become a revelation of what Jesus truly did on the inside of us. Come on, we've heard this scripture, Colossians chapter 1. There's 26, 27 there. He said what? The mystery of the gospel is what? This great, almost too good to be true news. The mystery of it. What it's all about is this very simple, basic thing Christ in you and the result of Christ in you is the hope the expectation of the glory of God but Jesus showed us what happens when the glory gets on the inside of you when you become aware of it the glory will get on the outside of you and Jesus said in John chapter 17 in his prayer to the father he said father the very same glory you gave me I've given it unto them so that the world would know that you sent me See, you can't be united with him and and not have the same equipment. It'd be very unjust for Jesus to say, go and do the very same things that I did and even greater works, but I'm not going to give you what I had. (laughs) 
But that's the way the modern church has treated what Jesus said. Jesus said, you go, whoever believes in me. Notice he said the believer, not the preacher. Not the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Not the one with the MDIV and the DIV and the whatever. The believer. The everyday Joe Blow Christian. Who's at work in the marketplace. Who's a lawyer, doctor, nurse, mom, teacher, landscaper, businessman. He said, the believer, whoever believes in me will do the very same thing and even greater works because I'm going to the Father. What was the purpose of him going to the Father? Him getting in you. And because he would be on the inside of you, everything that he is, all of his ability, his equipment, his grace, his anointing would be on the inside of you so that in any situation, at any given moment, you'd always have more than enough to fulfill the great call on your life. And you wouldn't have to fast and pray for 21 days to try to get something. And you wouldn't have to try to work something up either. See, that's, that's one of the things that really pushes sinners away and pushes church people away. We try to work something up. Well, friend, you don't need to work something up when you know you already got it. Amen. This is where even if you don't feel anything, if you just got a knowing... If you just got a knowing, I found out that that knowing will turn into a feeling. If you'll just know, if you'll just know, if you'll just know, I'm not a box. It's not about the box. It's what's on the inside of the box. But what's on the inside of the box, it will affect the box. It will affect the box. It will affect the box. It will affect your body. Come on, guys. Jesus became humanity so you could have some divinity on the inside of you. We understand this principle that I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. Every single denomination believes that I'm a temple of God. God lives on the inside of me. Friend, let me ask you a very simple question. And you don't even have to get past kindergarten to figure this out. If God's on the inside of you, how could his healing power not be there too? But the way that we've treated it is God moved on the inside of me, but he left his healing power in heaven. So now I've got to figure out the right confession and the right lever to pull and the right button to push and the right knob to turn to try to get what's in heaven to get in me. And all the while I'm confessing, I'm a temple of the Holy Ghost. God lives on the inside of me. You cannot separate God and his power. If God's on the inside of you, the power is already there. Jesus did not save you, so you had to run to a man to get you what Jesus already got you. And yet that's what we're doing. We're running all over the place trying to find the right person who has the right stuff. Friend, let me tell you something. When you got saved, you got the right stuff. Was that NSYNC or New Kids on the Block or something like that? The right stuff. I don't know. You've already got it. But what's go going on with a lot of faith people, we're like the dog chasing its tail. I believe by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I believe by the stripes of Jesus, I believe I receive. 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 But when you believed in him, you did receive it. Now you just need to know it. Because when we begin to understand that what's on the inside is what I actually need, and see, friends, understand, this is not you looking at yourself as God. No, this is you looking at the vine and the branch that's divinely connected. Have you ever walked outside and looked at a tree and noticed that, yes, you can see the trunk, you can see the roots, you can see the branches, you can see the individual parts, but at the very same time, where does the individual parts start and where do they finish? Where does the trunk and the branch actually stop and start? You can't tell. You can't actually pinpoint it because it's so divinely connected. And that's the way that it is with you and I. Jesus, he is the trunk. He is the vine. He is the sustenance. He is the source of life. He is everything. And we're absolutely dependent on him for everything. But once we got connected to him, we're separate, but we're one. We're separate, but we're one. We're separate, but we're one. And, and, my, and my dependence, my devotion, my praise, and my worship were two. But in my life and in my ministry, we're one. Amen. But in my devotion and my prayer and my study and my dependence, we're two. But in life, 
we're one. All that I need is in him. I mean, we could, we could spend hours on this. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, it says, We are one spirit with the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, over there in, in 45, 46, 47, it says that, that Jesus says, As is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, As Jesus is, present tense, for all of you who failed third grade English, as Jesus is, where's Jesus? At the right hand of God. As he is at the right hand of God, so are you and I right here, right now in these chairs. So quite literally, everything that's flowing in the glorified Christ is flowing in you right now. Everything that's flowing in the glorified Christ is flowing in you right now. Everything that's flowing in the glorified Christ is flowing in you right now. And there's more than enough of it for you and the person next to you and the person next to you and the person you'll meet tomorrow and the person you'll meet the next day. There's so much of it, it doesn't run out. Jesus said there's going to be a what? A well of, of living water, right, for you. And then he also said there's going to be rivers. So there's a well for you. That's never ending, will never dry up. And there's also rivers that will flow out of you. That same light, that same substance. For the world. For the world. For the world. Everything we need. Literally on the inside of you right now. And the, 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 the thing is, we just got to become conscious of it. We just have to become aware of it. When Jesus said, abide in me, and I in you, Amen. abide in me, what will happen? Fruit will be produced. Amen. A lot of us are trying to produce fruit without abiding in him. Because we're so confident that I know everything that I'm supposed to do to get this to work. And I cannot tell you how many times I've had somebody come to me and say, Chad, I don't understand it. I mean, I'm saying the right stuff. I've been doing this and this and this and this and this. And my response is always seasoned with, with grace, but it's always the same. You just told me your problem. Oh, what's the problem? You're doing this and 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 this. And you're depending on this and 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 this to get you what Jesus already got you. And in reality, you just need to become aware of him. See, this is where this, this piece of fellowship and awareness and consciousness of God comes into play for you and I today as believers. We have to become conscious of who we are in him and who's with us. Jesus makes this fabulous, I'll finish up here. Jesus makes this fabulous statement in John chapter 14, uh, verse 19 through 21. He said, on the day of salvation, you will know that I am in you. The Father is in me, I am in you. You are in me. And he said, I will manifest myself to you. I'll reveal myself to you. He said, on the day of salvation, you'll know that we are in union and you'll begin to experience me. You'll begin to experience me. He did not say you'll have to run to somebody so you can experience me. He said, because I get on the inside of you, you'll begin to experience me. What if we actually began to believe we are the body of Christ? What if I actually began to believe I am the body of Christ? What if I actually began to believe that these are the hands of Jesus on the earth and these are the feet of Jesus on the earth and this is the mouthpiece of Jesus? On the earth? What if I actually began to believe that I'm one with the vine Amen. and that he's one with me? That the one that's seated at the right hand of the cross, everything that's in him, it's flowing in me right now. What if I began to believe that? What if I actually began to believe over in Romans chapter 8? That the very same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead is the very same spirit that's giving life to this mortal body. What if I actually begin to believe that what he had and what did it for him is on the inside ready to do it for me? What if I actually begin to believe that? What if I actually begin to believe what Paul was praying over there in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 21? When he said, Father, I pray for them that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, that they would know the hope of his calling, that you know the plan of God for your life. And then he said, I pray that they would know the inheritance that you have in the saints. 
And number three, he said, I pray that they would know that the exceeding greatness of your power, which raised up Jesus from the dead, is in them and for them. This was Paul's prayer. Notice Paul did not pray, Father, I pray that you would give them the same power that raised up Jesus from the dead. No, Paul's prayer was, Father, I pray that you would open up their eyes and give them a revelation and an understanding that the very same power that raised up Jesus from the dead is already on the inside of them. That was Paul's prayer. The church's prayer today is, Father, give me that power. Paul's prayer was, God, show them that you already gave it to them. And yet we wonder why today we're not seeing the miracles that we know we should be seeing. It's because we're seeing wrong. We're praying wrong. A lot of our songs are just wrong. Paul was praying, God, let them know it's on the inside of them. And we're praying, God, give me it because I don't have enough.